Okay, hey everybody, and welcome to the Media Collective hustings for the general election 2017. Uh, my name is Lawrence Tyrrell, and I'm the head of speech and factual for Livewire. Uh, the Media Collective is a joint organization that uh, consists of Concrete, UEA TV, and Livewire. Um, thank you very much for turning out today. Uh, hopefully, we have a good night ahead of us, and uh, I'm sure we'll all learn something. Uh, that will reflect when we go to vote on June 9th. So as your moderator, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce the representatives in tonight's hustings. Um, so on my left, uh, from Labour, this is Tom Rednell. Um, he is 19 and he's been studying politics here at UEA. Um, he has been part of the, Na uh, the Norwich Labour Party as a mobilization assistant and he joined the party in 2015. Um, Will here is from the Conservative Society. He is the president of the UEA Conservation Association and he studies politics and economics. Uh, he first got into politics when he went to um, intern with the Conservative EMP, MEP Emma Clark McClarkin in 2014 in Brussels and he has also stood for uh, the local elections in Norwich and so uh, Nanette uh, is part of the Green Party. Um, she studies international development and she's president of Young Greens. Um, she's been involved in the Green Party since she could vote and uh, it's grown steadily for her and she's also stood as a county council candidate. And finally, Emma, Emily Cutler for the Liberal Democrats on my far right. Uh, she is a third year here at UEA and is president of UEA Lib Dems and joined the party back in 2014. It seems to be a common theme here, but she has also stood for city and county council uh, elections here in Norwich. Um, and so, yeah, that, these are our candidates today. So they've all drawn, drawn lots on which way their opening statements are going to be read in. So the um, running order for today is they will all have two minutes to read an opening statement. We will then move on to um, the first question. Um, here at the front, I have three prepared questions on a variety of topics, and then we will pass over to the audience and to social media, and hopefully we'll get some questions back. And then it will be uh, passed back to uh, the candidates for some closing questions, uh, closing statements rather. Each candidate has around two minutes to speak on the, on the topic, on the question, and everyone has a right of reply. So say, if Will mentions the Greens by name, the, uh, Nanette can interject and say, uh, well, once he's finished speaking, as a right of reply. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for coming out today. Um, and Nanette, take it away. This election is about solidarity, unity, and hope in the face of the destructive politics of the Conservative Party. It offers a really unique opportunity to stand together and provide a united front against a government which is systematically destroying our values and our institutions. And it's the Green Party that's been at the forefront of this movement. We've been working towards positivity and hope and working with other political progressive parties to create an opportunity for a fairer society that works better for us all. To achieve this, we've been working to create a fairer economy and we've been working to crack down on tax dodges and ensuring that we have a tax system that works best for us all as well as it can do. We've also been campaigning to have a second referendum on Brexit, which would this time address exactly how we want to leave the EU. We've also been working and will continue to strive to create a strong and critical voice on the environment and climate change, continuing to call up the major political parties when they fail to tackle these issues. We're also calling for a progressive alliance to be formed across the country, which would put aside the old tribal politics that we've come so used to, and work together to unseat the current government. Although this would require compromises and concessions from a few, it would work best for the many. Thank you very much. I'm um, available to make sure to talk directly into the mic. It's just good for our recording equipment. That's right, don't worry about it. Um, so Will, uh, you're up next. Thank you. So whoever is elected into government on the day after the election will be tasked with a rather tricky scenario. They'll be tasked with building a more secure united nation by taking action against the extremists who stand to divide our society and by standing up to the separatists who want to break up this country. But we'll also take the long-term decisions for a more secure future and they'll also be, also be tasked with building on the good work that the conservatives have done and to try and stick to a strong plan for a stronger Britain. 
Theresa May is the woman that you should be looking to in this election for delivering those things. She is a strong leader who puts the national interest first. She gets things done and when she becomes prime minister after, when she became prime minister rather, after the referendum, her priority was to provide economic security after the referendum, a clear vision and strong leadership. And that's what she has delivered so far. Throughout the process of the referendum negotiations, there will be a lot of difficult things to get through. None of the parties surrounded by me have even begun to put out the basics of what they would need to provide in the referendum and in through uh, the negotiations. The Conservatives have begun to lay out what you can expect, and that is the strength and stability that this country deserves. The strong leadership that you'll get from this country can only be achieved by voting Conservative. No other candidates can provide it. A vote for any other party risks Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister, backed and propped up by a coalition with Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP. The Liberal Democrats want to open and reopen the divisions of referendum, and so do the Greens. The choice facing the country at this election is all about leadership. There is a choice between Mr. Jeremy Corbyn and Mrs. Theresa May. And with strong leadership and working in the national interest, Theresa May is the candidate that will push through and provide the answers and the stability and the strength for us and all in the national interest. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, if I'd like to hand over to Emily now, thank you. So, how do I summarise the Liberal Democrats? Our mission statement says, the Liberal Democrats exist to build and safeguard a fair, free and open society in which we seek to balance the fundamental values of liberty, equality and community and in which no one shall be enslaved by poverty, ignorance or conformity. But what does this actually mean? As a Liberal, I believe that everyone should be able to carry out their lives as they wish without obstacles. The Liberal Democrats have a record of achieving this. We are the party that champions same-sex marriages. We are the party that stands up for human rights, blocking the abolition of the European Human Rights Act sorry, by the Tories. We are the party that time and time again stands up for the rights of those who are less fortunate than us, pledging to offer sanctuary to 50,000 Syrian refugees and 3,000 accompanied refugee children by 2022. The Liberal Democrats champ are champions of evidence-based policy. We don't pander to populism. Surprisingly, this week while campaigning in North Norfolk, I wasn't confronted about the EU. I was confronted about legalisation of weed. Um, <laughs> It can be shown from prohibition in the US that banning a substance doesn't work. It can be shown by our European neighbours in Portugal and in Amsterdam that legalisation does actually benefit society and stops profits from going into crime. That's what we are trying to achieve by building a fair and stronger society. We believe in standing up for future generations. That is why we are one, that is one of the reasons we are pledging to give the decision back to the people when it comes to Brexit. Theresa May has decided on a hard Brexit to keep her backbenchers happy with no regard on what will happen to our generation and Jeremy Corbyn is letting it happen. Both will be pulling us out of the single market no matter what the consequences and they don't have the mandate, no matter how much Theresa May shouts that she does. And Labour is all letting this happen. Okay, thank you very much, Emily. Um, I'd like to just remind everyone in the audience that we have a lot of mics and stuff, so background noise can be kept to a minimum. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, to finish us off then. Let's not be tricked by Theresa May and the Conservative Party in this election. This election is about far more than the Brexit negotiations. This is about the kind of society we all want to live in. Now, do we want to live in the kind of society where big businesses don't pay their fair share of taxes, whilst education funding and, um, and standards are declining? Or do we want to live in a society where we do tax businesses fairly? And we do provide a proper education service um, that runs for a fair economy. Now, this Conservative government 
has divided us all. Leave versus remain, rich versus poor, community versus community. Labour wants to reunite people through the Brexit process in a way that will benefit everyone. And on top of that, we will address the real issues facing our society. We will protect our NHS that is underfunded. We will scrap tuition fees and we'll ensure that everyone who, is, who works is paid a real living wage despite their age. Labour has a bold vision of a society that works for everyone. A society that works for us all when we leave university, where we have a job, where we have a home, and where we have a safety net there for us if we slip fall. Now, a vote for Labour is a vote for a more prosperous and fair society. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Um, so that was the opening statements. So now we're going to move on to the first of our three questions from the front here. Um, this will be concerning the economy. Um, as I said previously, um, we're going to get this time around, we're going to go right to left. Um, so Emily will start um, with um, a right of response for any of the candidates, if they are uh, the representatives, rather if they, their party is mentioned by name. Um, so Emily, um, concerning uh, Brexit, uh, the banks and business, businesses over the last um, six months or so have been threatening to uh, move, out, move their headquarters out of the United Kingdom. How does the Liberal Democrats intend to um, focus on a prosperous post-Brexit growth? Keeping us in the single market. It's the only way they're not going to move out of the United Kingdom because they need that no that free trade to prosper. They need that foot in Europe and that foot in Britain to prosper. And the whole pulling us out of the single market is going to be one of the worst economic decisions we are going to make in my lifetime. Um, we are turning the clocks back. We are not moving forward, and we're now in 2017, and we are acting like we are in the Middle Ages, and we only trade with the next county over. We don't. We trade with the entire world, and we need to open our borders up and open our um, country up to trade and not close it off. And both Labour's and the Conservatives' policy of closing us off to the to the single market, which, by the way, was not on the referent was not on the ballot paper on the twenty third of June last year. I didn't see it on there. I don't think that, I didn't know if you did. And Ni Nigel Farage said we would have a Swiss deal or we would have a similar deal to what Finland have, which means staying in the single market. So, really, this is what staying in the single market is what people wanted so i don't just keeping your back bench is happy for the sake by for um, sacrificing the economy is that the most selfish thing to do in my opinion and that's what's happening okay thank you very much um labor the conservatives anyone want to write a reply first no i mean First of all, let's just dispel this myth that no one voted to leave the single market. This was a vote where by a margin of over a million, we voted to leave the EU. And within that, it was pretty clear and consistent throughout the campaign that that was leaving the single market. In terms of David Cameron making it absolutely clear, there, were, there was no suggestion that we were ever going to be um, left inside. In terms of the literature that was posted through millions of our doors, it was absolutely unequivocal on the fact that we're leaving the single market. In regard to trade, as it stands currently, we already export more to non-EU countries than to EU countries. So if we do want to embrace trade, if we do want to push out and look out and be this open, developing and, well, improving society, then that really is where we should be looking. We should open up our doors and look for trade deals that would be prohibited within the European Union and within the single market. So these are all areas where we can improve. We need to reject the idea that the people didn't know what they voted for. They did. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Labour, would you like to write a reply? 
Yeah, I'd just like to point out to Lib Dem colleague that it is in the Labour Party manifesto that we will, on day one, rip up the white paper on Brexit and we will rewrite it, putting um, access, well, membership of the single market and the customs union at the centre of our policy. It is in the manifesto, you can read it. But um, we, have to, we, we can't go um, just abandoning um, trade with EU countries. Uh, they are out of the top 10 um, of our trade partners. Um, the uh, eight of them are um, members of the European Union. So for us, for Labour, it is imperative that we stay in the single market. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so Nanette, um, how does the Green Party plan on creating economic growth in I, a post-Brexit Britain? I can only reiterate a lot of what Emily said. We're, again, going to campaign to remain in the single market so that we can have the best opportunity that we currently can get to benefit from the trade deals that we already have with the EU. It's completely bananas to suggest that we knew exactly what we were voting for. Even the politicians who were campaigning for Brexit didn't know what would happen when Brexit happened. Um, I think it was uh, said afterwards that there is no post-Brexit plan by the Brexiteers. I think that's very indicative of how nobody could have known what we were going to vote for if even the people campaigning for it didn't know what we wanted themselves. Also, we were told that we would strive towards a better and a closer special relationship with the US and that would help our trade deals once we left the EU. That seems rather uh, worrying at the moment considering that the current leader of the US seems a bit more like a playground bully. I think we need to reconsider whether we want that special relationship to stay just as special. Okay, thank you very much. Um, William, um, how does the Conservative Party plan to embrace post-Brexit Britain for economic growth? So, under the Conservatives, one of the main things that we'll do is to continue to make Britain an attractive place for investment. And by doing that, we will ensure that our economy can continue to expand in the manner that it has done under this uh, government over the last seven years. Um, one of the ways in which we'll do that is by continuing to cut corporation tax and encouraging businesses to come here. And that is fundamentally a very, very clear way and, uh, that we can push through and encourage these new um, countries to invest in us and these new businesses to come and domicile within our country and bring jobs and prosperity to our country. Ultimately, also we need to consider which countries we can be looking at, and ideally all of the countries we've been looking at, to get the best possible deals in terms of our trade deals, and also working out the best possible deal within the EU. All of these are top priorities for a Theresa May government, and we will continue to push forward to make sure that we are an open country, and so we can push through with economic growth and trade. Thank you very much. And finally, Tom. How does the Labour Party plan to uh, on creating economic growth in a post-Brexit Britain? Okay, Labour wants to create the best conditions for investment in the UK. Uh, what we will do is personally, we will invest in um, infrastructure. Um, we will create banks which will put money into um, you know, new projects, transport, um, energy, um, and we'll create new jobs which are. Um, you know, high-skilled um, future sort of uh, economies, things like uh, renewable energy, um, it's the things we're going to invest in. So we create the right conditions for companies to look at us and say, I want to go and invest and put my business there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so moving on, guys, we will now be talking about um, education. So as we understand, um, early, early years education is one of the most important factors uh, in determining future success uh, and mit mitigating against uh, inequality across the country. Um, with some schools claiming that they um, are unable to cope, what will your parties do to address the issues surrounding schools and raise uh, and maintain standards within them? Um, so we're going to move from left to right this time. Um, so Tom and Labour, um, off you go. Okay, so um, education really starts, um, you know, early on. It sets the sort of foundations um, in um, in the sort of early years care, um, 
And what we will do is we'll commit to either uh, 30 hours uh, free childcare per week, um, and we'll extend that to, I think it's up to two year olds. Uh, I may be wrong, but uh, I think that was in our manifesto. And uh, we'll make sure that those places are properly funded um, so that um, these childcare places can um, make sure that they, they keep going. Um, and then um, with, uh, we'll make sure that our um, high schools, uh, our schools and high schools are funded um, properly. Um, and this, I know it sounds like a lot, a lot of investment, but um, it pays off. We'll have people with uh, better skills, uh, better equipped when it comes to um, university and so on to deal with the challenges. Um, and then they'll go into higher paid, high skilled jobs, uh, which will return uh, the money we invested through tax. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, well, how do you intend to, how does the Conservative Party intend to um, work with schools to increase early year development? So, as it stands, the Conservatives have put the most amount of money into education of any government. Um, they're going to pledge to continue doing this and they will put four billion extra pounds into the school's funding pot. As part of this, they're going to rearrange the formula, they're going to continue to protect the people premium which ensures that they've got the most money going to the areas that is most important for those people who are not in the best situation, who don't have all of the privileges um, that are accessible to them to ensure that they can continue to do as well as they can. As part of this new funding formula, the Conservatives have pledged in their manifesto not to cut funding from any schools. And I think that's a really core and important part of this. And with all of those policies, I think the education is really going to pick up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Nanette, um, how will the Greens work to enshrine early year education? Well, I think it's important that we don't just discuss funding when we talk about education. We talk about improving the quality of education as well. We've got a number of policies which we think would drastically improve the quality of education at the moment. Uh, for example, having teacher-friendly teaching. At the moment, teachers are really clogged up with a lot of the bureaucracy that goes with teaching. By, by being able to free them up so that they can spend more time working with children, it would drastically improve the quality of the teaching. Um, we also think that there needs to be more funding for children with special educational needs who are drastically oversighted at the moment in the current system. And also we think that it would be really important to reduce class sizes as well because at the moment we have huge class sizes, it means that children don't receive the one-to-one -one education that they really need. And I think that all these things are really, really important to discuss when we talk about early years education. And while it's been really valuable to talk about increasing funding, talking about how exactly that funding will be used in the schools is just as important. Um, okay, thank you very much. And finally, Emily, um, what is the Greens? Uh, what is the Liberal Democrats' plan for early year education? Um, so we have have sorry, we have evidence that we have already strived in this area during the coalition. It was our policy. It was pupil premium was one of our came from our manifesto, and it has drastically improved the lives of many students who are from less well-off backgrounds and we have promised to triple the early years premium to a um, thousand pounds giving children from disadvantaged backgrounds the best start in life we've also promised to make sure that every single teacher is actually accredited making sure that everybody is getting the, a decent standard of education um, because at the moment due to free schools and other things you don't actually have to be accredited so there's lots of disparity across the whole country so making sure that everyone's accredited making sure that that you get everybody has the same chance and at the moment there is as um we there is a lot of overcrowding so we need to invest in more schools more buildings so we have promised to invest seven billion extra into children's education and so that also means that no school loses money per pupil in cash terms, which if you actually look at what the Conservatives have been doing over the last couple of last year, they have actually cut pupil premium. So they're going a bit against their word there. 
Let's keep it polite. <laughs> um, but okay. Um, so, um, Will, would you like a right of reply? Oh, I'll, I'll just reiterate what I said initially. There's going to be an increase in the budget by four billion by 2020, and as a result of that, there's going to be the most funding that at schools have ever had. Um, so I, I think we're pretty much good on funding. Um, just to clarify, you. Her question was actually about whether or not you'd, um, or the right reply would be actually about whether you had cut premiums, uh, people premiums over the last couple of years. Is that correct or not? I don't know the specific facts on that, I'll be honest. Okay. Hi, thank you very much. Um, okay, guys, so um, that's it for education. Um, we're now going to move on to everybody's favorite topic. We're going to talk a little bit about Brexit. Um, so, um, however, we are very much framing it within the idea of what it means to be here at UEA. Um, so as far as um, your party's post-Brexit uh, policy is, um, how, what is your party's stance on international students um, and their rights to study here and whether or not they should be included in immigration statistics? Um, it has been a focal point of the Conservative parties. Um, uh, stance on Brexit. Um, so I will actually take it over to Will to start and then we'll go to the next. Tom and Emily. So the Conservative Party are clear that there are very clear benefits to immigration and international students are a very, very valued part of our higher education and society more broadly. But there is also the need for consideration of immigration on the whole. It's clear that there are areas where there has been too much pressure on, for instance, public services and there hasn't been enough done to limit the costs of immigration. One of the pledges that Conservative parties has stuck to and uh, continued to try and reach is to get immigration under 100,000. And as part of that, we can't start ignoring students. It's also worth noting that if students um, come here, then eventually they, um, well, most or some will leave and therefore they will not be including net migration figures over that entire period. And the ones that stay, we do need to account for. So we can understand what resources need to go into the government. And I think that is a worthy target. Okay. Um, so I'm going to press you a little bit on uh, that last statement there. Um, you, for students who um, are expected to remain within the uh, country, um, according to the Conservative Party manifesto, uh, they will, in quotes, uh, expect all students to leave the country at the end of their course unless they meet the new higher requirements that will allow them to work in Britain. What are these requirements? So essentially there is a requirement that they meet, um, they get a job and the figure, I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but it has moved up in recent years um, to reflect um, some of the increased pressures um, on the, for instance, our um, domestic employment markets. And so we do try and also look out for everyone and there is a slight priority with domestic students there. But if they do find those jobs um, nice and early, then they're very, very welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, Nanette, um, how, what is your party's um, stance on international students, their rights, and whether or not they should be included in immigration statistics? I'm very supportive of a lot of the, well, of all of the international students that come here to study at our universities. It's an incredibly important point of all our universities that we encourage as many international students to come here as possible. It creates a really diverse atmosphere, which is really, really constructed to a really good learning environment. I think it's really sad that we're turning away international students as soon as they finish their degree. These are some really valuable, great young minds that have been educated at some of the best higher university institutions there are in the world. And yet we're saying that because of your nationality, you're not allowed or we'd rather you didn't have a job here. I think that's counterintuitive. I don't see how that improves the economic forecast because we're, these people have the potential to you know, earn great amounts of money and put it back into the economy. And I think that that's basically the same as discriminating someone against someone because of their nationality. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, Tom, um, what is Labour's stance on international students and the uh, and their rights? Okay, um, the Labour Party has committed to um, sticking to the current scheme, where students can um, from here go abroad and study there, and students um, from 
uh, EU member states can come across to here and um, study here. Um, and I think it is good for um, good for the countries, good for uh, both you know the UK and the EU. Um, people get a lot of experience out of it, um, and when people come here, they might find they like it, and they might get uh, might start start filling up some of the jobs that uh, we need filling in um, high skilled areas that aren't currently covered. So the Labour Party is 100% committed to um, keeping the scheme there, so that um, international students can study here um, and across the UK. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, Emily, um, how do the Liberal Democrats stand on immigration statistics and the rights of international students? We want to protect the rights of our international students. So, I mean, as you can see from being on a university campus, um, international students make up a large proportion of our community and they add value to our learning. Um, having people with different opinions and being brought up with different being brought up with different points of view and different scenarios to you adds to your learning. And the Lib Democrats stand by this. Um, we we want to protect schemes, especially schemes like Erasmus, which encourage. Um, Trip like abroad placements abroad and students come and go to the UK and we have some amazing universities in this country and quite a lot of them at the moment rely on international students and we would be at a loss without them so we are grateful for them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as a quick fact check, um, I want to have a shout out to my little researchers over there. They are fact checking everything they said. Um, but as just for little points of interest, it is noted that you mentioned the Erasmus scheme. Um, Labour, Lib Dems, and the Greens all do support the uh, Erasmus scheme. The Conservatives haven't actually mentioned it in their manifesto, which is not to say that they don't support it. But if you would like a right reply on that, you feel free. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's worth pointing out that the Erasmus scheme is not dependent on the EU. We take in lots of international students from America, from China, all across Asia and Africa. So we are clearly very interested in taking a diversity of talent. There's no reason to assume that because we're leaving the EU, there's no less interest in the Erasmus scheme. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Um, so that's it for me um, from the questions from the front. So we, uh, whilst um, as some of you came in and have some of you have been on Twitter and as such, we have um, been uh, collecting questions from you. Remember, if you would like to comment on how this is going, um, to use the hashtag UEAGE2017. Um, so the first question is from Ben, who apparently is in the audience. Ben, yes. Yes, please. So, um, one of the biggest problems facing people in our generation in particular are rising living costs, particularly with regard to rents, which in real terms are rising year on year on year. And we're sort of getting to the point now where let's let, you know, it's becoming impossible to almost rent in parts of the country, let alone dream of one day getting on the housing ladder. So my question is to everyone, what would your parties do to address rising living costs with a particular focus on rising rents? Okay, we're gonna go right to left. So Emily, if you'd like to start. Hi, so the Lib Dems have got some great policies in this area. Um, we are champion, we really want to build lots and lots and lots of new houses. Um, I think it was 300,000 a year by 2025. Um, that may not be correct, that, um, so that's off the top of my head, sorry. Um, but, and we also want to encourage a scheme called Rent to Buy. So those who may not be able to afford a deposit may still have a chance of getting on the ladder because you can almost, instead of like paying, you pay rent payments, but it actually goes towards your house rather than just going towards a landlord. Um, but in terms of specific renting, we have tried to um, strongly um, enforce the rights of the tenant and make sure that the rights of the tenant are strong so we are a strong believer of not having things such 
as having paying for guarantees and paying for your contracts being written up um, because that happens every time you go to rent somewhere and that may be hundreds of hundreds of pounds every year that's just going down the drain for every person and that's obviously a massive expense um, and we also want to build more the housing we're building at the moment isn't what people need a lot of it is being built for investment it needs to be built for people to actually live in so we need to build affordable housing so some of that will be council housing so that anyone no matter what their age is so under 25s as well um, can get get access to council housing and they can because there will be a but a pool of housing there for them because if we're not building these houses it's not going to be there um, as well as there'll be lower cost houses for those who don't qualify for council houses but quali but can't afford to buy one okay thank you very much um so uh, nanette I think what's important to address when we talk about how the cost of living has gone up is how we don't have as much disposable income as we used to have. And I think it's really important that we discuss how the Conservatives have been a large part, have played a large part in causing that to happen. We're planning to end the very exploitative zero hours contracts and to raise the national living wage to £10 an hour and to make that mandatory for all businesses. And both of those things, I think, are really important first steps in improving the, first of all, your quality of life and also for maintaining that the, while the cost of living might be going up, the amount of money that you have is simultaneously going up in conjunction to that. But we're also going to be building a lot of new houses, and not only will they be new houses, they'll also be very environmentally friendly houses, so sustainable housing. Um, we're currently building the fewest number of homes as we have done since the 1920s, and I think that's really, really important that we talk about. It's a major, major crisis, and it hasn't been addressed properly by the Conservatives. Okay, um, so would you like a right to reply on zero-hour contracts? Okay, so I think... Specifically on this topic, it's really relevant to students in that I know many, many, many students who have zero hour contracts and this enables them to study full time at university and then when it's summer and when it's their holidays, they can go home and then work during that period. If there were no zero hour contracts, then that would mean that they would be unable to have that. There would be a mandated minimum amount of hours they'd have to do. There's some suggestions of one hour contracts which would be the most silly, daft thing in the entire world because it means you'd have to go all the way home to do one hour if um, in that particular week or month in able to keep that job. As it stands, you can work all through university uh, on your degree and then go back home and work that zero hour contract and that is to the huge benefit of students. So scrapping that would be severely detrimental. I think it's actually a very unwise policy. Um, shall I just move on to the housing? Um, so, in regards to this, the Conservatives have made a clear pledge to meet the existing commitments that build a million homes by the end of 2020, and then a further 500,000 by the end of 2022. Part of this, of course, will be in building new social and council housing, and they're looking at freeing up a lot more space for that. Um, so, those policies show a clear commitment to making sure that we can expand the housing, which enables there to be more places to go, and it's basic economics, you increase supply and the prices will drop. Um, rather preemptively, I'll just say, one of the policies pledged by the Labour Party, it sets a very, very dangerous precedent. So they want to have rent controls. And the Nobel economist Paul Krugman, so by no means a right-wing individual, says among the best understood issues of all economics, and among econ uh, economists, the least controversial, is rent control. And this is because if you impose rent control, the quality falls because there's no incentive to keep the upkeep of the housing to the same extent you were before to compete for those individuals. The quantity of that housing falls because there's no incentive to build housing so you can get that rent from those people. And then the poorest suffer because those who are le in a least likely position to um, have a reliable income are then picked out of the market by the landlords who can pick superior candidates. 
So I think building more homes is the answer, and having rent controls is the least economically sensible thing that any government could actually do in this sector. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing that I'd like to push you on, because you said relating to um, your, the, the Conservatives' plan to build, build more houses, uh, one of the more controversial uh, policies was that they scrapped um, housing benefits for under 21s. How does the Conservatives' plan to make this housing accessible to students, uh, students and young people if they can't afford to live there? Okay, so there's uh, two parts that I'd like to reply with here. First of all, in regard to students, particularly higher education students, when they get to university, they have access to loans and grants to the total of about £8,000 a year. In London, um, Imperial put together a really rather helpful guide of how much it costs to live in London. So we're looking at the highest end of the market. They say about 11000 so that means if you're going to work a term time contract, you'd need to do about 10 hours a week on minimum wage. So you can meet the full costs um, as it stands in terms of that. When we're looking specifically at the cutting of um, the housing benefits for 18 to 21 year olds, it sounds harsh, but you also need to recognize the amount of caveats that are put into this process. So if you've worked in the last six months, then you're exempt from this. If you have a child, you're exempt from this. If you've come from a home where your parents are abusive, you're exempt from this. There are lots of considerations taken in this policy that I think need to be focused on. This isn't a reckless policy, it's well thought through and it's saving a lot of money where people can normally live with their parents and choose not to at the expense of the state. And if we can prevent that, I think it's a worthwhile option to take. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before moving on to Tom, um, I would like to just clarify we've had a fact check um, and that is that um, Will here suggested that uh, rent controls would mean that uh, landlords wouldn't face incentives to do uh, to do up the houses. Um, according to their manifesto, they have said, uh, Labour have stated that there'll be tougher minimum standards and landlords who abuse these will be face fines of up to 100,000. Um, that's a general fact check. Um, so moving on, uh, Tom. Um, with Labour. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, so no, we can't ignore that there is a huge problem in this country and that is the housing crisis um, and it's because governments have not been building enough houses and as a result um, rents have increased year upon year upon year and what the Labour Party is committed to doing in its manifesto is building two million homes over the course of the next parliament most of those will be um, social housing and affordable housing so that you know, young people can get their foot on the ladder, they can get a home, students um, can have you know, affordable housing. Um, and the other thing um, is that the Labour Party is committed to um, making sure that there is a £10 an hour minimum wage. That extends um, to everyone who, who's um, of working age. They can whether you're 16 or whether you're 25, you'll still be paid £10 an hour minimum, um, which is only fair because young people do tend to have um, quite um, a difficult time in life. Um, I mean, if, you want, if you're trying to run a car, um, you know, your first few years of car insurance is incredibly expensive. Um, and it's unfair that um, young people have uh, earn less, um, but then have to pay a lot for their, their car insurance and other things as well. Um, so what the Labour Party is committed to doing is paying £10 an hour minimum wage and we will scrap zero hour contracts so that you are um, entitled to a certain amount of hours per week um, so that you're, you, you, know, you have a secure job there. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so our next tweet, our next question rather comes from Twitter, uh, from Daniel. Remember you guys can get involved with UEA GE 2017. Um, so the next question, um, and it's to everybody, uh, what policy do you wish your party didn't have? <laughs> um, so we're going to go left to right this time. Um, Tom, which... <laughs> I really don't know. Can I get back to you? <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, this, this is a bit of a curveball. Would anyone like to go first? <laughs> okay. <then. laughs> I'm happy to. Okay, yeah, fine. Thank you. 
So Theresa May has committed um, to enable a free and open vote on uh, the hunting ban. I just don't think it's very necessary. I think it's only relevant to a very, very small section of society. I, I just don't see what the cause is. I don't think there's going to be the support in Parliament. I don't think there's support outside of it, honestly. Maybe it's a nice idea to have to chat about it once in a while, but I think it's already been thoroughly um, kind of deflected. So perhaps not the best use of time. But there we go. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for going first. Uh, we're now going to go right to left. So, Emily. Okay. Um, this is like the hardest question I've ever had to answer. <laughs> With hindsight, I wish when in coalition, it's not the thing you're thinking of, it's not the thing you're thinking of, because I'm not mentioning that. <laughs> um, we wouldn't, we would have um, been slightly stricter on the Conservatives on voting reform, and not and had better refer well either had well, whatever happened. I can't really remember what happened that much because I was very young and it wasn't very publicised. But that make that emphasises it all that it wasn't publicised at all um, very well. And I just think that should have been done a whole lot better. But yeah. So to clarify, your the thing you didn't like is that they weren't strict enough on voting reform. Okay, I'm, I'm going to change my mind. <laughs> no, okay. it, no, it's fine. Just, um, okay, I also don't think I think they should have. There's things that I regret that they did. Yeah, in coalition, and one of them was austerity. <laughs> Austerity, to an extent. So I don't know. I'm okay, digging um, myself a hole. It's thing. all right. Don't worry. I'm going to let you off the hook for that one. <laughs> um, I would like, um, as it's relevant, um, if we could stick to um, current policy rather than things that happened in the last government, that would be um, appreciated. Um, so Nanette, um, the Green Party are proposing that we rise, we raise rather the GDP we spend on foreign aid from 0.75 to 1%. I don't believe that goes far enough. I suppose I'm biased because I study international development, but I think that it's incredibly important that we have a really, really strong, solid aid budget, and I don't think that 1% is high enough. People talk about it as though we're spending huge swathes of our budget on all these people abroad, when actually 1% is a really measly amount compared to the amount that we spend on defence and things like that. And the amount that we could save on defence if we were to raise the foreign aid budget to immense, I think it doesn't go far enough as policy. Okay, thank you very much. And Tom, uh, what Labour policies don't you like? Uh, I think I would have to go with um, the fact that the Labour Party is committed to um, making the House of Lords completely uh, democratically elected. Um, I think that if we have um, people who are appointed there from certain different professions, um, it is quite good for legislation. We've got scientists, um, uh, architects, uh, people from church, whatever, um, who um, advise on policy there. And I think that um, Parliament needs uh, that little bit of uh, extra advice there rather than uh, just more politicians, really. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so our next question is coming from Ellie. Hi there, um, can we get a mic? Okay. Hi, this is quite a specific question. Um, what will your party do to tackle the cuts to learning support services in schools, which have resulted in a lack of support for students with special needs? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go left to right this time, Tom. Um, so, yeah, what will the Labour Party do to tackle um, support uh, cuts to learning support services? Okay, so Labour Party will uh, make sure that every school has access to the support staff that they need for any student that... Um, 
suffers from uh, learning difficulties and uh, we'll make sure that teachers are um, trained up properly on how to deal with um, the uh, situations that uh, they might find themselves in. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Will? So as well as the funding increases that I alluded to earlier, the Conservatives are also pledging to increase um, the number of free schools by 100. So I think this is one opportunity that we can use to expand our schooling stock and reduce the amount of students uh, in each class. And doing so will enable uh, teachers to focus more on the individuals that need support within each class. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nanette. Uh, we're planning to raise special fun um, funding for learning support centres in schools so that people who are the most vulnerable and most in need of the support get it. Thank you very much. And finally, Emily. Um, we plan to give teachers more support um, just because they need more support in classrooms generally. And if they have more time, they'll be able to concentrate more on those. I also think um, quite high on, like, personally, is raising, making sure that things like mental health as well is seen as important as physical health. Um, and we're prioritising making sure mental health waiting lists are the same as physical health waiting lists, and making sure that the, the NHS is, the school isn't burdened by the NHS the lack of facilities in the NHS. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so we're next going to um, put it over to the audience um, for an open question, if anyone uh, has any. Um, so if anyone have a question they'd like to ask our representatives today. Yeah, thank you. Over in the jacket, Tom. Do you have any comments there? Cheers. Um, this is a question to the Labour candidate. Um, I was just wondering, at a time where particularly young people are looking for an alternative to our current government, um, how you thought best to unite people under Labour whilst they're still do so divided over Jeremy Corbyn? Okay, I think um, young people... Well, well, I, sorry, I'll start with um, the, the Jeremy Corbyn issue here. Um, I think most of the Labour Party is united behind Jeremy Corbyn. Most of the membership is, and a lot of the um, MPs um, since this election started have fell in line. And um, we're all committed to our party leader, and uh, when he's elected, we'll continue to support him um, as our leader. Um, and I think Jeremy Corbyn has the best policies for, for young people. And I think young people should be uniting behind him. I mean, things like abolishing tuition fees um, and uh, you know, funding education properly, uh, real living wage, these are things that young people all want. Um, so he's by far the best person for young people, and um, we are united behind him. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, um, we have an anonymous question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it shouldn't be that controversial, but um, so the anonymous question is: What are the candidates, or the representatives, rather, and your party's takes on UK's future special relationship with the US? Um, it should be noted that in January. Uh, Mr. Trump described uh, the two uh, the special relationship and shared between the two countries as one of the great forces in history for justice and for peace, as he invited Theresa May to the White House back in January. So yeah, um, we're going to go. So we've just gone left to right. Have we? Yeah, we're going to mix up. Nanette, you're going to go first. Then Will, Emily, uh, Tom. So what is your what is the Green Party or what is your uh, view on the future special relationship? I think it'll come as much of a surprise that we're not overly keen on Trump. Uh, I think that we really embarrassed ourselves leaping to meet him as soon as we did when he became elected. The pictures of Theresa May holding his hand while he walked down some steps didn't really reflect too well, I thought, on the general consensus of the British people on their opinion of Trump. I think we need to look more widely abroad to where else we can foster a similar special relationship with. 
America is no longer leading the world in the way it used to. There are a lot of other burgeoning economies that are doing very, very similar roles and have similar amounts of influence. And I think that it's important we branch out slightly and don't look so closely to America for that level of influence that we once had. Also, if you look at the intelligence leaks that happened after the Manchester bombings, I think we need to really consider just how much we want um, America to play such an important role in our defence. Um, I think it's really, we need to question whether this is a special relationship that we want to pursue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Will? So I think the American issue, I'll call it, is a tricky one because Donald Trump has been a bit all over the place when it comes to what he's been saying. Um, it was a fantastic sentiment, the one we just heard and um, repeated. Um, but then there are also the issues that we just heard about um, intelligence sharing being leaked. And our intelligence services share staff. Um, we share information and we are tightly integrated in terms of international defense. So I don't think it is an option that we can kind of drop those and pretend that we're not closely integrated in the way in which we are. Um, so I think we do need to continue to foster a strong relationship with Donald Trump and his government. And I think we all need to look to other figures within the party. Um, so for instance, Paul Ryan came to Downing Street and reiterated strongly that America was going to be one of the first, or if not the first, at our doorstep the day after we leave the European Union to give us a free trade agreement. And America is still a huge, huge economy. Their economic influence, I would say, is still unparalleled. And the importance of getting a free trade agreement with them will be the difference between pushing off and getting a strong start in Brexit, giving us the, the power and economic certainty to give us a strong negotiating position and really push on and continue to provide the economic growth and jobs and ultimately security that under a Theresa May government would continue. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, Tom. Uh, no, so not finally, rather. Um, Emily next, and then Tom. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Don't worry. Um, so, I actually want, wonder how much of this special relationship is special in Britain's eyes, but not in America's. Because although it has been said we have been put to the front of the queue, I believe that is no longer the case. Um, and we have now been put to the back of the queue when it comes to trade deals and guess who's in front of us, the EU. Um, surprisingly, because they're slightly, quite a lot bigger than us, and it makes more economic sense for America to trade with them than it does for us. Um, and to be honest, I don't really want to be associated with him. I'm not even going to mention his name. Um, <laughs> I don't want to be associated with him, and I don't think very many people in my party do, because um, he is be, had many misogynistic comments, racist, homophobic. He's a man, and how he ended up like. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Okay, and Tom, um, what is Labour's and what is your own personal view on the future of the special relationship? Okay, um, well, this, this sort of special relationship um, with the UK and the USA you know, goes back like 100 years. And um, it comes of no surprise, really, that um, Donald Trump and uh, Jeremy Corbyn aren't that similar um, and don't agree on a, on a lot of things. Um, now, you, I don't think I, I could see him holding hands with... Um, <laughs> Donald, but um, no, uh, I think our focus isn't more on building a stronger relationship with the USA. It's about keeping a strong relationship um, with EU member states uh, once we have uh, left the EU, and that's uh, where our focus is going to be. We don't want to sell ourselves out to the Americans, um, and I, I believe that uh, back couple of months ago, Theresa May um, was asked uh, whether she would allow uh, US companies to um, sort of it, let them into um, the NHS, uh, and I wouldn't want to see um, my NHS run by big US firms, um, 
I'd like to see it run uh, by the UK, and that's what the Labour Party is committed to uh, renationalising our health service. Um, but just to go back to the first point, yeah, we don't want to build a strong, a particularly stronger relationship with the US. We want to keep a good relationship with the EU member states because uh, that's what works for us, really. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to go back to a, like a fact check point of interest. Um, you've expressed that you'd, uh, Emily, you've expressed that you'd like to see the Liberal Democrats distance themselves from Trump. Um, Tim Farron wrote an entire article in The Guardian about why he supported the Syrian airstrikes a couple of months ago. Um, where do you stand on that with relation to your party? Because obviously it's not exactly distance. The Liberal Democrats, by extension, are not being distanced from Trump. Do, was Tim Farron right to do that? Um, obviously, Trump is going to be around, hopefully, four years possibly eight um there are going like there are going to be things that we still will agree on um my, that's my personal opinion it's not um the syrian air <laughs> sorry um i don't know quite how to say the seeing airstrikes came were something we did agree with and like um if if there's something you do agree with someone even though you may not like them if it work if if it, it benefits both of you to work together that kind of makes sense and that's why I, I do understand where he's coming from on that. Like, if that makes sense. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that suffices. Um, okay, so guys, we've just come up to 8 o'clock. Um, so um, are the rest of you happy to continue t taking questions, or should we move on to concluding statements? I'm happy to take more questions. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so we'll continue running until we run out of questions, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question is coming from... Wow, well, within reason. <laughs> um, the next question coming from Andrew. Um, I'd just like to ask the candidates where they stand on like uh, economic competence. Uh, unfortunately for us, our generation now is uh, saddled with over 1.5 trillion pounds of debt. It's going nowhere, and we are going to have to pay it back. I'm hearing a lot of spending, and I'm hearing a lot of pledges which don't appear to be costed and with no detail. Uh, if the candidates could really sort of share their economic standpoints more closely uh, for our future, in for us, that'd be helpful. Uh, yeah, of course, if you'd like to. And um, so we're going to go from right to left this time. So starting with Emily. Um, so Lib Dems manifesto is fully costed. It has also been fact checked by the Institute of Fiscal Studies which is fully independent body, and they have said, yeah, that's pretty much, that's fine. They haven't said the same for Labour's, because there's some, yeah, they're a bit unsure, but I'm not going to go there. Um, however, we need, okay, yes, I understand, we need to reduce the deficit, but we have been going through austerity since 2010. It's now 2017. The deficit was meant to be reduced two years ago, by according to George Osborne. They're now extending that to 2025. We can't keep cutting and cutting. Sorry, Most economists... Sorry, the deficit the debt? The deficit's not. I'm just asking, sorry. Yeah, but it's still, still not zero, is it? No. But that's what he said it was going to be. Okay. Yeah? yeah <laughs> And um, and we need to reduce our day-to-day -day deficit. And as in a, as someone who is about to finish my economics degree, I completely agree with that. But I do agree that we need to put some money into long-term investment. And actually, the reason I can go into it with you, I have written papers on this. <laughs> so, but the IMF did recommend that we could cut um, spending without affecting GDP that much. They have now gone back on that statement. 
and have said that the fiscal multipliers were different. So it has actually impacted our growth. Okay. Okay. <laughs> they, no, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I would just like to say um, for the, for the remain, remainder of the hustings, if we could try to keep our answers a little more brief so we can get through as many questions as possible, that would be appreciated. Um, so, Nanette. Following on a lot of what Emily just had to say, we've been told that the deficit was going to be gone by now. Each time there's a budget, each time there's a manifesto, we're told that we're given a new date for when the deficit is going to be eradicated and we still haven't met that date yet. It keeps being risen and risen. People are voting for the Conservative Party on the basis of them being a really strong, economically sound party. And so far they haven't proved themselves to be that at all. They can't even predict when they're going to be able to fulfil one of their most basic aims, which is the well, the complete eradication of the deficit. On the subject of how we're going to fund things, how the Green Party are going to fund things, we're, our main priorities are to increase taxation for big businesses and big corporations, and also to have a, one, a wealth tax on the top 1% of earners. Um, in terms of it being fact-checked, I think it's important to point out that a major economic think tank released data that said that neither the Labour Party or the Conservative Party's manifestos added up. Um, so I think it's perhaps a question that you should direct more towards them, who seem to be struggling more with their economic policies than we are. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, Will, leading in nicely there. I mean, just to start, the Greens haven't costed their manifestos, so that's why we're, they're not having any yeah. difficulty. There's no numbers to criticise. Um, there's always going to be difficulties when you do cost manifestos, and there's always kind of little problems that are reliably picked up by the IFS. Um, and I'm sure in time those will be corrected. But the Conservatives, as it stands, are going to continue to pursue their target of balancing uh, the budget, and we're going to be doing that by 2025. And I think that's an admirable target, considering at the end of the day, this is an amount of money that is pretty phenomenal. And it is a burden on all of our young people who inevitably will end up paying it back. And the fact that Labour don't seem to have any strong plan to actually cut this down and to reduce the debt in the long term um, is slightly baffling. Um, but, you know, when you look at the Conservatives on the budget deficit, it started um, on about 10% of GDP when we got into office, and it's now below 3%, so we are slowly but surely making our way there. It's been more difficult than we'd anticipated. There's been a Euro crisis, there's the EU referendum, which no one anticipated, and then there's been Donald Trump, which has added further um, complications and uncertainty into the mix. So making economic forecasts decades into the future is tricky, but the Conservatives have pinned down a date by which we're going to balance the budget. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, Tom from Labour. Okay, the Labour Party um, has committed itself to uh, reducing the budget deficit over the course of the um, next Parliament so that we do eventually balance the books. Um, our manifesto is completely costed. Um, the spending commitments total £48.6 billion, pound, and the amount we raise through taxes also totals £48.6 billion. Pound. But on top of that, when we do invest this money, uh, what's going to happen is you know, businesses are going to look at the country and think, wow, they've got, you know, they've got great infrastructure, it, it, they'll think it's a worthwhile place to invest their business, and that will bring in more taxes um, from those businesses. And, um, and more jobs um, and more prosperity, really. Um, and you know, that's the, the main difference between Labour and the Conservatives, is that we, uh, you know, we're, we're committed in different ways to reducing um, the, the deficit. Um, we think that um, austerity is a political choice, not an economic um, imperative. We don't need to do that to get our, our way out of, um, out of the budget deficit. Okay, thank you. Um, would you like a right of reply to that? I would. I mean, in regards to the costing of the Labour Manifesto, um, there's no costings for the nationalisation which is going to take place, which is going to be to around some £186 billion. Pounds. Um, if we look at their higher education funding, they've pledged um, £9.96 billion pounds for covering higher education fees, but at the moment, students pay £13.5 billion on their fees. So the question is, are the universities going to be taking a funding cut or have Labour made up their figures? There's some real difficulties 
in getting this through. And as well, when Labour are increasing, for instance, um, corporation tax to 26%, the IFS have said that corporation tax is one of the more damaging taxes on growth and affects where companies choose to locate and that in turn affects where they're going to invest. So some of the narrative that's coming from the Labour side and some of the numbers just are completely confused. They're not adding up and it's just really strange. Okay, thank you very much there. Um, so we're now going to move to another question from Twitter. Remember, if you are following this on Facebook Live or anything like that, and you want to get involved, um, just tweet in UEAGE2017. Um, so this is um, from Sarah, and this is a tweet directly to the Greens. Um, in relation to lower class sizes, how is this going to happen? Will it not be more reliant upon having more teachers? Well, we're planning to simultaneously raise the number of teachers that receive funding um, so that there will be more teachers to meet the demand that's going to be happening when there are more uh, smaller class sizes. The idea of having small class sizes isn't really a choice, it is a necessity. At the moment, class sizes are huge and students are suffering as a result. We shouldn't be asking ourselves if this money is there, because this money is there, it's just not being used in the right way. So I think that it's important that we okay, yes, discuss where the money is coming from, but also why the money isn't there in the first place to fund the smaller class sizes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so our next question is, um, again, from Twitter, and this is for the Conservatives. It's from Maddie College. Um, <laughs> I mean, unless you'd like to read it out. <laughs> oh. Okay, fine. Um, why are the Conservatives acting like zero-hour contracts are the only way students can work over the summer? Yeah, it, it, was, it was in regards to there was the sort of thing as a fixed-term contract or a flexible contract, so why is it almost massive the fault to do that? Thank you very much. I mean, it's, it's a choice that's made between students and their employers. They find it the most suitable and flexible way to continue working their contracts over summer and throughout um, in terms of guaranteeing their job from year to year rather than having to have a new contract for each time they have a holiday. Um, if Labour want to address that in a manifesto, they're like, well, they're welcome to, but I had a flick through and I couldn't find any way that they're looking to basically patch that um, problem with zero hour contracts. So I'm, I'm all ears for a solution. Okay. Um, do you have a response to that? No, it's all right then. <laughs> Um, okay, um, so this next question is for the Liberal Democrats again, um, and it's from Rosie. Hello. Uh, could we get a mic over? Me again, sorry. Um, this question's uh, for Emily, and I was um, just wondering how you think it best. Um, to repair the relationship between Lib Dems and young people, considering obviously post tuition fees, there's quite a lot of disillusionment and the feeling of being let down and lied to. Um, how you thought it was best to repair that? Um, so we are trying our best not to break any more promises. Um, <laughs> um, and it is going to be a long process and it's going to take a long time if you actually look at our manifesto personally i feel like i was actually quite geared towards young people um it's got quite a lot of stuff that i believe young people actually would associate with and i think um that goes part of the way because i feel quite a lot of people young people feel that they don't they're not being listened to by politicians um, and we and it's also about trying not defending what we did but trying to explain why we did why we did what we did we were, we, unfortunately, we were in a situation where we were in a coalition government. We didn't have control of the whole government. Um, if we did, like, I would love, like, I'm sure we would have done that, but unfortunately that was 
what happened and um, we are suffering as you can see that the party is suffering as a consequence of it um, but we are trying to speak to young people and just on an individual basis through things like your policies like Europe and make and making sure that they realise that their voices are being heard because they're not being heard by, in my opinion, by Labour and the Conservatives because it's a true fact. Um, okay, Labour, would you like a right of reply to the idea that you're not you're not listening to students? Um, they're not. Um, they're not actually being heard. They're just. Be, you're just kind of pandering. You're just. You're just promising false promises, like. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah, Labour. To the idea that you're just pandering to students with your policies. Uh. Well, obviously, you know, we'd be mad if we didn't want anyone, any students' votes. Um, any party would, would be. But um, we didn't do it just, just to win votes. It's because it's part of the... the we, we don't do things because, you know, we just want votes. We do it because we, um, we want... It's all part of our sort of world view, what kind of society um, we want, which is why we're committed to abolishing tuition fees, bringing back EMA, um, and, and many other things. Um, you know, we have a, you know, a, a, a really large amount of people um, joined the Labour Party to vote for Jeremy Corbyn. A large amount of them were young people themselves. Um, and they, there was clearly a demand for um, a leader like him. And uh, that's what we've got. Um, so, yeah, we're not just pandering for votes. I think um, you know, it's, it's necessary that we um, you know, put forward these policies because that's what's right. Okay, so we're going to quickly go to another question from the audience. Um, this is from Matt. Hi, yeah, uh, this is the Lib If you question. come and get a mic. <laughs> um, yeah, this is to the Liberal Democrats. You started off uh, at the beginning of this hustings saying that the Liberal Democrats are champions for LGBT rights and LGBT yeah. issues because you said uh, gay marriage came into effect while you were in government. However, I was wondering if you can detach the party from the personal um, opinions and thoughts of Tim Farron, who yeah. obviously we've all seen the controversy is yeah. essentially a homophobe. So I was wondering about that. So um, his, he has a relatively strong voting record. He, the reason he didn't he voted against the last reading of um, the act was actually due to he voted for the, for the first two readings but against the last reading because it forced priests to marry people even if they didn't believe that and the way the Liberal Democrats work is that yes we have a leader but our policy is based from our members so um, we have a system of one member, one vote. Our policy is really based on what our members want it to be. And um, he, ha he did go back and say that he, um, like, that he didn't think that gay people were sinners. Um, and if you go, go. I just think that what he says is different to what he does if he is meant to be representative yeah. if he was prime minister and he was meant to represent the entire country if truly in his heart he thinks that gay people are sinners different of what he says how can he then try and truly say he's protecting them gay marriage is one thing to have that legal but when there are when gay people or all lgbt people are more likely he, to be victims of violence he, and of high rates of suicide how he, is tim farron going to deal with that he was one of the first people to condemn what happened in i'm going to pronounce this wrong now chechnya um he was one of the first leaders to do that um and whatever you want to take from that you will it is seen 
from quite a large proportion of our party is actually who is LGBT plus so it isn't an issue to quite a large portion of our party um, they feel comfortable being there um, and that people are going to have religious views um, and it, it's going to be difficult for him to detract those from his views, he, I believe he tries his best, and that's all I can really say. And I personally, I would like to see the other leaders questioned on this because <laughs> they haven't got the best records either. Um, Corbyn has said that basically being gay is a choice, so it's both. I feel, yeah, but. <laughs> but so yeah that's all I have to say okay then um, right um, we will have a few quick few right of replies then it's the final question and we will lead on to concluding statements um, so yeah um, Labour um, how do you how do you respond to that <laughs> well that's the first time I've ever heard of that comment myself whether it's true or not I really do not know but um, at least my leader has um, consistently voted uh, things like gay marriage. He did vote for gay marriage, right? He did. Yeah. He voted against final reading because he didn't believe that priests should be forced to do it if they didn't want to, which, to be honest, is if they didn't believe religiously, which is, you, there's a balance between religious freedom. There has, like, that's, unfortunately, that was his belief at the time and he actually regrets that now if you speak to him now he regrets that but yeah he didn't vote against gay marriage um okay sorry so, can i just clarify one quick who's he Confirm. okay pronoun gay because it sounded like you were saying you Corbyn for a second i was very confused okay um is there anything else you'd like to add on that um okay um uh, conservatives have also been mentioned conservatives you know not being around the bitch, not being blunt, um, do not have the best voting record for gay marriage and things. How do you respond to LGBT rights and championing them? So at the end of the day, the Conservatives have always believed in free votes on these moral issues. And at times, there have been people who have voted in their personal beliefs and it has been against um, the extension of rights and at times it has been the contrary, in favour of them. In regard to Theresa May, she too comes from a religious background, the daughter of a vicar. Um, she was one of the primary proponents within the cabinet, the Cameron cabinet, of pushing forward the vote for um, gay marriage. Um, and so I think Theresa May can stand as someone who has moved and changed her views over time and has turned her back against um, some of the difficulties she's had with her religious background to being a progressive liberal woman who I am proud to support. And so it was in the Lib Dem manifesto, not the Conservative manifesto. That's why it got passed. Sorry. Okay. Um, all right then. Um, no, it's I just fine. Don't like the Conservatives claiming things that actually were Lib Dem policies. That's one of my pet things. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Um, so for our final question comes from Twitter today, and then we will be having concluding statements. Um, our final question is from Sam Prudence, and it is for um, Will and the Conservatives. Um, approximately 30,000 uh, disabled people have died as a result of conservative disability cuts. Um, he'd like you to explain that. Um, the statistic for this comes from the Department of Work and Pensions, and it was revealed between 2011 and 2014, um, 2.2 uh, two and a half thousand people died after the employment thing. Et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, That's where that statistic is from. So on this issue, it's undoubted that the Conservatives have made mistakes on this. And it is undoubted that the methods by which they took the, um, the judgments to work out whether people continue to receive disability support and allowance were not adequate. And for this, I think you know, there, there is a large um, moral and social debt to those people. And it is a real, real shame, and it is something that I personally regret 
I don't think the party has got right in the past. It is something that we are going to look to try and improve. It is something that we can um, change. And I think that, you know, Theresa May has made a real commitment to look out for those who perhaps under the Cameron government weren't looked out for as much as others could be. And, um, you know, maybe under George Osborne and David Cameron, there were those who perhaps did better economically, but were still caught between um, different safety nets. And it's a real shame that that happened. And it's very difficult to forgive the actions that resulted in this awful, awful consequence. But I do think Theresa May is a different kind of woman. She'll push for a different kind of policy and uh, effectively look out for those people and increase the safety nets to make sure that people don't slip through the gaps. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you to all our candidates. Um, so we are going to now move to concluding statements. It's going to go uh, Nanette and the Greens, uh, Will, Emily and Tom. I'd ask you to keep these to about a minute maximum because we are looking to get as close to an 8.30 finish as possible. Um, so yeah, um, take it away. I think what we've seen here in this debate is that there is really no strong opposition to Maine's Britain here at the moment, apart from with the Green Party. All the other parties are still dwelling on mistakes that they've made in the past and really have failed to offer any solution to rectify these mistakes that they've made. There's no focus in many of the manifestos on any green issues whatsoever, very little focus on how we're going to solve many of the overseas crises that we have had a really important hand in causing. And I just don't see any alternative but the sort of the normal bourgeois sort of established politics that we're experiencing today in any of these other candidates. Thank you very much. Uh, Will. So just as a quick rebuttal, since 2010, the CO2 emissions have fallen by 13%. We've doubled the amount of renewable energy that we produce as a proportion of total energy. So there is progress being made. Um, but on the whole, I think for this section, I'll focus on those who are just about managing and those who Theresa May is really pushing out for. So for instance, it's rather relatively unknown that actually under the Conservative government, inequality has fallen. We're at a point where the Gini coefficient, the measure of inequality, is at 31.6 in terms of uh, disposable income per household. And the EU average is 31. So we're pretty much in the middle of the pack there. Um, the top 1% are paying a significant amount, and that's a good thing. The top 1% pay 27% of all income tax receipts. The top 1% of corporations pay 81% of corporation tax receipts. If you look at what has happened in terms of disposable income for households, it is only the top quartile since the financial crisis where it has fallen. Those who are in the lowest quartile have seen a 13.21% increase. So that's a significant thing if you're not on very much money. And the Conservatives will continue to look out for those people. Those who are difficult, having difficulty managing this real target group that is important, most important, that we nurture and look after and give economic progress and success to, has fallen. It's been halved from 12% to 6% in this Conservative government. And we want to halve that again and continue to do so and really push these people up and forward and into the world as Britain becomes a more free, a more open and a more prosperous Britain. And to reason they can deli to deliver that with a strong and stable government and no one else can. Always with the sound bites. <laughs> Emily, um, <laughs> Yes, uh, the closing statement was from the Liberal Democrats. Um, so, the Liberal Democrats, we are pushing for actually a fairer tax system. The IFS have said that the revenues from Labour's tax plans is vastly uncertain and highly unlikely, to, highly likely to be lower than, than under the Liberal Democrats. And the Liberal Democrats' proposed increase of benefits are much larger. This myth that Labour is for the working class is not true. The, the whole idea of Brexit is going to punish those at the bottom end of the income the most simply because of higher inflation due to the falling pound. And going to, back to Will's statement about um, those on the lowest income, 13% of their disposable income rising, that, again, is partly due to a Lib Dem policy of raising the tax threshold. And do you know what? 
David Cameron told us that it was idiotic and it would never happen in, unless we were living in an idealistic world, and yet it did. Um, also, I would like to point out we are one of the parties that do strive for green energy. We, while in coalition, we did set up a the first ever national green investment bank, um, and we are um, pledging to help prevent 40,000 premature deaths a year by cutting air pollution. All of this shows how strong the Liberal Democrats could be. We just need your vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Tom. Okay. I'd like to first start by pointing out to the Green Party uh, about their statement earlier. Labour Party does have some green policies. Um, it's in our manifesto, and you can look at it, and it's under the title of Environment. Surprise. Um, uh, <laughs> what I'd like to say is, um, you know, I believe you can only trust Labour to deliver for you. Um, but, you know, students, we've all faced um, the, sort of the front of austerity, really, with our, you know, with uh, treble tuition fees um, and uh, and uh, the axing of uh, the, you know, bursaries. Um, you know, Labour has committed to doing a lot of things that's going to benefit um, young people, students like ourselves here in this room, um, like abolishing tuition fees and bringing back EMA and um, and bringing back uh, bursaries for nursing students as well. Uh, I, yeah, I believe you, you, know, you can only ca count on us uh, to stand up for your interests. I hope you can count your vote. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Um, that is the end of our lessons, pretty much on 8.30. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all of you for coming. Um, thank you so much for um, all our participants. If we could get a little round of applause or something. <laughs> Yeah, um, congratulations to everyone. You all did excellent today. Um, the most important thing is obviously June 8th. Uh, please, everyone get out and vote. Um, it is so important whether you vote for any of the four parties in front of me or somebody else who's running in Norwich. Um, just make sure uh, you are there on Poland Day. Um, so you can check out all the coverage of this um, Media Collective uh, with TV, um, who I presume will be producing a video out of it, and Concrete and Livewire, um, obviously. Uh, thank you so much for coming, and yeah, get out and vote. <laughs>